Now, coming to tonight's session, please allow me to welcome Sandeep Srivastava, the moderator of this session. Sandeep is an experienced product and intellectual property management consultant. He has worked with global clients to leverage intellectual assets at every stage of his product cycle. Currently, he is helping early stage startups reach their next inflection point. He is passionate about emerging technologies, patent law, and solving real world problems. Great to have you here with us, Sandeep. Handing the session over to you now. Thank you so much, Shama. Uh, Language, ladies and gentlemen, in many cultures is considered an agency that influences or transforms reality. The power of language is so remarkable because of its ability to change someone's mind, boundaries, and perception of objects that is anything visible of or sensible. I'll go as far as saying that with the right use of language, one can be made into believing in practically anything. If so, is language used to convey reality or does language create reality? I'm going to leave you with that thought to ponder. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having me as your host this evening. Now, from shop floor to the boardroom, and of course, in many places in between, strategic storytelling continues to wear its way into mainstream business practices. And that's because story can go where analysis is denied admission. You're right, the imagination. Digital transformation requires changes that impact the very fabric of companies, uh, you know, how they operate and how they behave and how people feel when they walk through the door in the morning. And as we know, the pandemic has accelerated the digital adoption of technologies by several years. And that makes storytelling so crucial in the current times. We'll hear more about this topic from our guest tonight. But before that, we have a couple of quotes for you. Shama, can you please launch the first poll? Ah. So if you have ever walked out of a movie theater feeling like James Bond, then it's one of these chemicals talking. Out of syllabus, that is in a story in itself, takes you to the good old days. So the idea here is not to test your knowledge, but uh, to pique your interest in uh, digging a bit deeper into the subject. So that when you tell a story to someone, you can very confidently say that I know what's going inside your head. Okay. Oh, there are 13 person, people who are saying this, dopamine. Well, the answer is all three. And uh, can we launch the next poll, please, Shama? Focus is a scarce resource and attention spans are dwindling. So you need to make sure that your story is having the right impact. Again, there's no right or wrong answers. We just want to know your preference. You can pick only one. Great. So I'm super delighted to welcome Anjali Sharma. Anjali is based in Singapore and it's almost 10.30 there. So that makes it even more special. Anjali is one of the leading business story consultants, author, global keynote speaker, and founder of Narrative, the business of stories. She has spoken on the topic of storytelling in almost every corner of the world. She helps business leaders, data analysts, sales professionals, marketers, and TEDx speakers find and tell stories. Now, her background constantly informs her work, so it's not just theoretical, but it's based on some rich experience, knowledge, and understanding of the strategic issues of the companies, as well as the employees, and that helps them deliver their best work. And until he partners with global thousand companies, including Facebook, LinkedIn, Airbnb, Microsoft, Shell, SAP, and Danone, her book, Story, is going to be released soon. And before we get into your presentation, I have seen your videos, Anjali. Let me inform the audience that Anjali publishes two videos every week. One is, thank God, it's a story Saturday. And the other one is, it's Wednesday video time. Your videos are so vibrant and so full of energy, Anjali. So I have a very important question for you. What keeps you going? 
Mm, well, thank you for the very warm welcome and hello to everyone. Um, I assume you can all hear me well, you can see me well. Just give me a little hello, hi, something to acknowledge that I'm audible and visible to you. Um, so just let me know via just the chat that uh, hi, Srinidhi, lovely, lovely to hear from you. Hi, Madhuri, uh, glad you can hear me well and you can see me well. So I'll go back to Sandhir's question. Uh, what keeps me going now there is one rule to me speaking my rule to speaking is that you have to constantly interact with me either via chat or via just you know putting your hand up or sending some kind of an emoticon from the other side because if you don't talk to me i don't talk to you then we have 40 minutes of silence on zoom um so i will answer sandeep's question but i have a question for you all before that uh the way I'm going to answer that question is by first asking you a question. How many of you have ever heard of Malcolm Gladwell? You don't have to tell me who he is. Just let me know whether you've heard of him or no. Use the chat box and tell me, have you ever heard of Malcolm Gladwell? So I can see some lovely yeses coming from there. Okay, so not a problem if you haven't. It's not like you've lost a mark there or anything of that sort. Malcolm Gladwell is a Canadian-American. He is a a very, very well-known author um, and a thought leader. His father taught in the University of Waterloo in Canada. And uh, he says that on every Friday, somehow at 7 p.m., his father's students who were Indian used to just show up from nowhere expecting to be fed and expecting to be taught. So if he knows Indians, he knows Indians for two things, people who have love for food and people who have love for learning. Now, when Sandhir asked me the question, what keeps me going, putting two videos out every, every week, my answer is clearly it's got nothing to do with food, but because I'm an Indian too, it's got the greed to learn and become really good at my own craft of storytelling. That is what keeps me going. I'm like any other Indian who has love for learning. And that is why I publish two videos every single week and I have been doing it for close to about three years now. That's really interesting, Anjali. Now the floor is all yours. Thank you for that lovely answer. Not at all. My pleasure. I love Anna. Yes, I love Malcolm Gladwell's book. Love to know which one is your favorite. Just drop that in the chat box for me, then I'll share which is mine. Um, yes, everybody. So um, I am a story practitioner. I tell stories, but isn't it ironic that the only thing I am super concerned about is that in the next 40 minutes, I should not get you to a point where any one of you says, Are Anjali ji, kahani mat bataye, please get to the point. So I want you to know that today is about storytelling, but not the one that makes you feel kahani mat batao, don't tell tales, but the one that says, Ah, I get your point. Stories for business are very different to stories for entertainment. I mean, there's nothing wrong with stories for entertainment. I am a self-confessed Bollywood bhakt who has a song and a dance ready for every single emotion. But that style of storytelling for some other time. Today, we will stay focused on storytelling for organizations and specifically storytelling for digital transformation. Non-Hindi people in the group in India, we have, if just in case you haven't understood what I just said, uh, in India, we have a way of saying to people, kahani mat batao means don't tell tales, don't be long-winded, don't make stuff up, just get to the point. So there's like this negative connotation in India with storytelling. And what I'm saying to people today is that today's storytelling has got nothing to do with that style of storytelling. Today's storytelling is very business oriented and specifically, very oriented towards a digital transformation. So let me get started by taking you to the year 2003. In the year 2003, a gentleman by the name of Andrew Pohl, who did somewhat of a role that a product leader or a product manager would do, was called by a large retailer organization and asked to build 
a pregnancy prediction model. What was a pregnancy prediction model? A pregnancy prediction model had the ability to be able, it was a product that had the ability to be able to predict when a woman was pregnant in her second trimester. In the United States, because the birth records were public, by the time the baby was born, marketing to a mother was a very crowded space. Everybody knew that, everybody was reaching out to moms. So this particular retailer organization decided that we are going to build this pregnancy prediction model and we are going to be able to predict whether a woman is pregnant in her second trimester and be early in marketing. The pregnancy prediction model was built by Andrew Paul. It was super successful. But few years after the launch of the pregnancy prediction model, Model. One day in the morning in Minneapolis, outside of this large retailer store, a middle-aged gentleman walked up with some envelopes in his hand and screamed at the person at the reception and said, I want to see your store manager. So the person at the reception of this retailer mall got a little bit confused and said, what happened? He called the manager out quickly. The manager said, sir, how can I help you? He takes his hand, puts right in front of the manager and says, these are the vouchers for baby milk, baby food, diapers, cream, etc. You sent these vouchers to my home, to my daughter. Are you trying to encourage my daughter to become pregnant? She's only in high school. Then the store manager looks at the envelopes in a shock and looks at the address and says, yes, that's the address we would have put. We would have done that. That looks like an envelope that has gone from us, our place. He profusely apologizes to the gentleman and goes back to his office. The store manager remains extremely worried for a while. And then in a couple of days, he called back this gentleman to apologize one more time because he's so embarrassed of what has happened. He calls and he says, look, I am the store manager of the retailer store. You came to the other day. I wanted to apologize one more time for what had happened. There was this silence from the other side. The gentleman says to him, well, in fact, I was going to call you. There have been some activities in my house that I have not been aware of. And my daughter is actually pregnant. She is due in August. Now, what's the point of the story? Why am I telling you this story? The point of the story is that a today's product manager or product leader has an ability to know so much that sometime through the data, they know more than a father knows about his daughter. And this story perfectly, perfectly showcases and demonstrates that to us. Now, do you agree with me that yes or no, put a yes or a no in the chat box for me. When you listen to that story, are you not amazed in a us that how a pregnancy prediction model can tell that a woman is pregnant and even the dad didn't know that she's pregnant. And this exactly same confidence amongst product manager leads to another situation, another story, which is a personal experience of mine that I will share with you. Not that long ago, I was working with a large social media company and one of the product manager that I worked with there, I asked him, can you please tell me in one or two lines, what do you do? What do you do? And he said to me, Anjali, the best way for you to be able to know what do we do is to pick up your phone and press the blue icon. I say the blue icon because that's how you will know what social media. I mean, there's a couple, there's a few blue icons, but you should be able to tell which blue icon I'm talking about here. So take your phone, press the blue icon and tell me, what do you see? I picked up the phone, press the blue icon. I say on my timeline, Nikhil, I see images of cute dogs, healthy recipe, lots of running information. And then he very nicely says to me that, um, did you not, did, did, is, are these not the things that you, that you like? And I turned around and said, yes, of course, these are the things I like. And he says, see, I know you, I know all about you. Um, and at that moment I heard him and I said to him, Okay, so you know a lot about me as a product manager. As a result of that, you look at the data and push communication to me or information to me based on what you think I like. But do you know why I like these things? You have knowledge about me, 
but do you have understanding about me? You may have information about me, but does that mean that you can have communicate with me? Information and communication are two very different things. Information is when you tell me, I may or may not receive it. Communication is when you tell me something and I receive it and it is transfer of emotion. Now, I want to make a point repeatedly that today's product manager through data may know a lot about people, but they only have knowledge about people. They don't have an understanding of people. Now, some of you may feel that pregnancy prediction model story, which is published uh, in a public domain and is actually very well known within the, within the data space, it, it may upset you, it may irritate you. And that is exactly the point I'm trying to make here, that you may know something, you may have knowledge about something, but you may not have the understanding of us. You may not have the understanding of the human beings that you are trying to serve. And the problem with that is that we are all so caught up in wanting to story tell that we forgot to story listen. You can't story tell until you learn to stories listen. If the goal is to forge a connection through storytelling, through communication, then you're first going to have to listen, story listen, then only you can come up with the right story to tell. My assertion today is that this desire to want to learn to storytell can never be fulfilled in a right manner unless you learn how to story listen. Now you may say to me, how, how does one come up with perfect stories? How does one story listen? And how does one then come up with stories that they can tell effectively? Well, I wanna take you through three to four examples of real life cases that I have worked with, clients I have worked with in digital transformation space where we were caught in a situation where we had to learn to tell the right story. But before we told the right story, we had to really story listen and understand what was going on. So one more time, you can't possibly story tell until you learn to story listen. So let's begin with the digital transformation space and I'll share my experience of the digital transformation space with you. Uh, but before that, I wanna ask you a simple question. Somewhere in May last year, uh, in May, 2020, there was this funny meme that was rotating around an internet um, where the question was, who led the digital transformation of your organization? So um, Shama, I think I have a poll there for people. If you can just put that poll up, if you have that poll ready, um, who led the digital transformation of your organization? And the three options were, was it your CEO? Was it your CTO? Or was it COVID-19? And a lot of you have actually already started responding to that. The funny thing about that poll was that most of the people would go and take on COVID-19 because you know what? In COVID-19 time, we were forced to transform digitally. People learned to have weddings online. They learned to have dinner parties online. They learned to have birthday parties online. We learned to we always knew how to shop online, but we increased that a lot more. So our activity online increased a lot. Companies like Airbnb knew that they could not survive in this environment in the host business sort of setup where people will come and stay in the apartments. They shifted through digital transformation to creating experiences. And do you know, one of the hosts in Lisbon called Pedro created this experience called Sangre and the Drag Queens and did such an amazing job of it that he earned 130,000 US dollars in one month and very, very comfortably survived the economic impact of the pandemic that was happening. The point I'm making is that with digital transformation that happened around COVID-19, it was the one which we were left with no choice. There are only two reasons people act. The number one reason is when it is a question of survival. Number two reason is, am I going to thrive? Survive and thrive are the only two reasons people would act. And if your story is not telling me a survive or a thrive, I am not going to act. 
COVID-19 was a survival story, almost like when we lived in the caves and we had the saber-toothed tiger running behind us, we didn't need anyone to motivate us through telling a story. We just ran for our lives. So that kind of digital transformation is not the digital transformation I'm gonna be talking about today because therein you don't need to tell the story. You have no choice and you have to jump on the bandwagon and transform. There is another promise of digital transformation, which is the survival, where the leader sees before everybody else, what's the change required? If we don't change today, then what are the problems we can land ourselves in? That comes with the promise of thrival. If we do this today, we will thrive in the near future. And these are the stories that I want to share with you. The heartbeat of these stories is the ability for people who worked on these stories to have to first story listen before they story tell. So up until now, I have shared with you that you can't story tell until you learn to story listen. There are only two reasons why people act, either survive or thrive. And digital transformation was a survival story, not a thrival story. But then there is a lot of initiatives that we are running in organizations now where leaders see ahead before anybody else sees and is getting people to move and adopt digital transformation so that it's not too late to make the change happen. Let me start off with my very first story. My very first story is that of Matt. Matt is the CEO and president of a large large manufacturing company. I had worked with Matt and his team before, but in October 2020, I got a call from Matt's office where he said to me, Anjali, we are going to introduce artificial intelligence in our organization, and we're going to have this whole team of people who are going to implement artificial intelligence. Every single department of our organization is going to have to have a project based on AI. AI we have to have for everyone, AI for everyone, for our better future. Well, this was a digital transformation in conversation. I had worked with this client before. I knew exactly what I needed to do, but I was just about to make a mistake because I was going to just story tell without story listening. So the point of this particular learning was that I was almost about to tell a story like a PR company does, but not as a journalist. In a corporate setting, you have to learn to tell a story like a PR, like a journalist, not like a PR company. Let me explain that a little bit to you. When you think of a PR professional, what comes to your mind? Please use the chat box and tell me. When you think of a PR professional, what, what, what comes to your mind? How is this person dressed? Where is this person seated? What are the things that come to your mind? Please use the chat box and tell me. And when you think of a journalist, what is the imagery that comes to your mind? Please tell me what is the imagery that comes to your mind when you think of a PR professional? And what is the imagery that comes to your mind when you think of a journalist? I'd love to hear. Okay, so Debushish says, glamorous person like Karan Johar. <laughs> you are so lucky, uh, Debushish, that I know who Karan Johar is. Most of your other speakers might be a little bit confused with. I watch Coffee with Karan a lot. Uh, Puneet says, suave dressing, crisp personality for PR too much highlighting about organization PR. Um, okay, when you think of a journalist, what comes to your mind? Someone in the trenches trying to get the right story out for us, right? Exactly. Christina, yes, absolutely, right? Journalists are people who get into the trenches and find the right story. In corporate world, we have to be corporate journalists. We are not looking for swab style crispiness. We are looking for people who can go find stories and tell stories that matter. So let me tell you how I was going to make a mistake and then how we fixed it. So I went into the organization, I spoke to a few leaders and I said, okay, let's look at one particular department which is human resources department. Why should someone who works in human resource department want to adopt artificial intelligence. The story we built was of this particular individual who worked in this organization for a long time. And when he first joined the organization, he used to be the first impression of the company. Whenever somebody applied for the company, he was the one who would welcome the person, take him around, conduct the orientation before he actually took him to that particular department. Now, today, 
The same person never gets to interview and shortlist people. This person is just sorting CVs. The reason for that change is that in the past, there was only one way for people to send CVs to the organization when in the weekend newspaper job posting was done. So the number of CVs that were received were low. But today, the number of CVs that they receive are so much more because through LinkedIn, post uh, forums, uh, company websites, so many places, these CVs are coming. The human resource professional of a large MNC today has become a CV sorter. CV sorter versus a first impression of the company. So how about we give this hack work of a job to artificial intelligence that is able to sort the CV. Now, some of you may go into the track of is the artificial intelligence uh, you know, smart enough that it will consider the biases and stuff like that. I understand that's a topic on its own and, and there are considerations around that, but largely the artificial intelligence has an ability to be able to do big sort for this person. We want this human resource professional to be people's person, not to be a CV sorter. I built this story along with the leadership team and I was just about to help them get ready for the delivery. We looked at all the departments. We looked at what exactly is AI going to do for these all these departments and just two days before we were about to deliver it I had this gut-wrenching feeling that I have just sat in a boardroom and built the story like a perfect PR person I haven't done my job like a journalist I asked the CEO can I please go and speak to the people on the ground. And he said, of course, when I started conversing with people on the ground, I learned that people had already bought into the idea of digital transformation. They said, having an AI, we are not challenging that. We are not questioning that. That does not concern us anymore. We know we have to get AI. The thing that concerns us, worries us, and stresses us is how are we going to learn how to do this? So you see in pre-COVID world, we used to build the why stories, why you should do digital transformation. What is in it for you? What is the self-relevance for you? But in the post-COVID world, our stories are divided into two big sections. Section one goes into why, and section two goes into how no organization is just getting away with encouraging and telling people, rallying people to want to adopt digital transformation. They are having to say, here's the idea for the digital transformation and here's how you're going to do it. We created an entire learning academy, a learning roadshow for these people to start it, learning how to how to implement AI-led initiatives. And that was the most important aspect for these people in this story. So you see, I was about to make a mistake because I was not listening. I was just storytelling. That's what it takes for you to be able to story tell appropriately. So I'm just gonna ask you one more question now. My question for you is that if in an organization you have an ability to be able to tell a story for a certain digital adoption, what kind of an identity would you adopt? What's the identity that I mentioned that you need to adopt to be able to tell the right kind of story? Use the chat box and tell me, you can ask the questions in the Q&A, but you can use the chat box to just answer my question so that I can see it through, through my right eye. I'm quite trained to be able to look at the chat box as I'm going along. Please tell me what kind of an identity do you need to adopt to be able to tell the right kind of story in an organization. Remy, well done. It is that of a journalist, an investigator. A corporate storyteller is not a performance artist. He does not stand up on the stage and entertains people and people all clap for the fun that they've had because this person has been so entertaining. In corporate storytelling, you are a journalist who finds the story and tells the story, the story that will get you the right kind of a direction. All right, everyone, I'm going to move to my next story. My next story is that of, of Rachel. So Rachel, um, 
works in uh, for a really large bank. Uh, this bank is an international bank. She's based in London. I worked with her in February this year, and she looks. Her team looks after the third party window verification. So, what does that mean? Very simply, what that means is, say, for example, we are using the Zoom platform today um, to be able to have this conference. So, if any digital platforms are used by the bank, then it's Rachel and her team who verify that platform. They look at it and they make sure that this is the right kind of platform for the bank to use. So there's a, it's a lean team of 10 people who do all the verifications for the bank. Very simply, their task is they look at the checklist, they actually go through everything and make sure whether this is a safe platform for the bank to be used or no. When I started working with Rachel, Rachel said to me, I have a really big problem. I said, tell me, what is it? She says, the problem I have is that in the year 2019, my team and I verified 1900 digital platforms for the organization. We had 10 of us. In the year 2020, COVID-19 hit, the need for number of digital platforms in our organizations increased. As a result, our verification increased. And now we are having to, we had to approve 2,000, 2,400 platforms. That's like in one year going from 1,900 to 2,400, the number of the people remained exactly the same. People were totally stretched in the year 2020, but we had no choice but to do it. Now, this is 2021. I'm about to announce the strategy for this year and the goal for this year. This year, we will be required to do 4,200 verifications. There is no plan to increase the number of team members. We just have to be able to do it. And I looked at her and I said, so Rachel, is it physically even possible to do it? She says, yes, it is possible to do it if you use the right tools and no more can my team member work with a checklist. They are going to have mastery in cybersecurity because only when they have mastery in cybersecurity, they can look at that many number of platforms and be able to use their intellect, knowledge, and experience, make connections, and do those verifications. Put simply, I have to get my people to go from checking the checklist to actually being must, having mastery in cybersecurity. So I looked at her and I said, why are, why are you concerned then? She says, I'm concerned because of the workload that is going to come along with all of this. And my question to her was, along with the workload, there is an opportunity to be the workforce of the future. They are going to be the cybersecurity professionals. I don't know if any one of you read the news this morning or no, but Microsoft just today announced a heavy investment in cybersecurity in the, in the near future. If you become a cybersecurity professional, your value in the marketplace increases. Every digital transformation comes with the promise of becoming a very valuable workforce of the future. There is a problem with digital transformation. The problem is that before people are becoming really good at it, they're having to learn it. And that hangover is what we are finding most of the leaders caught in. Leaders are caught in the hangover of the transformation, not in the future. We took that particular story for the rest of the year, 4,200 verification. But before we make you do that, we are going to send you to become cybersecurity mastery professionals, and you will be so valuable in the marketplace. As soon as we shifted that, people were really not concerned about the work. What they were looking forward is an opportunity and ability to be able to go to an academy and gain those expertise and bring those expertise back. Now, one more time, I'm going to say to you that we were going to tell the wrong story or not able to tell any story unless we had not stopped and really tried to understand the world view of the people. We story listen before we story tell. So the point of Rachel's experience for me has been 
tell the story of the opportunity, not of the workload. Every time we have designed a digital transformation story and people are getting all stressed about the workload that comes with digital transformation, if we shift people's focus to the identities they adopt in future, because of being part of that digital transformation, their motivation levels increase. People are not excited by goals. People are excited by new identities they adopt. The goal is to run a marathon. The identity is that of a marathoner. The goal is to write a book. The identity is that of an author. People are motivated by new identities. So tell the story of opportunity, an opportunity to be a cybersecurity master professional, versus verification. The goal is verification of 4,200 platforms in this new digitally transformed world. I'm gonna to move to my third story, but I want you to use the chat box and kindly, kindly tell me, according to you, what was the point of this second story? What was the point of this second story? The second story that helped Rachel motivate an entire team of people to want to change. Please tell me what, according to you, is the point of this story? There are no right or wrong answers, but I'd love to see some participation from all of you in the chat box. I'd love to know, what do you think? It's about the people, not the process. Devishis, you're already my best friend. I'm loving the interaction from you, from current Joha to people to processes. You're talking all things to me today. So thank you very much. Remy, lovely, motivating to get a new identity. People want to adopt new identities, but sadly, the visionary leader gets caught up in the hangover of digital transformation and then starts talking about the goals, not about the new identities that the people will actually adopt. Let's move to our next story. And based on what the time is, perhaps my last story for today, because I really do want to spend time and answering your questions as well. Sandhir, I, I, I request you to just ping me and let me know if I'm going over time. I'm relying on you as my lovely uh, partner here today to keep me on track. You're, um, good. You're good. Okay, good, thank you. Um, my next story is that of Jane and perhaps my favorite story in all the digital transformation projects I've worked with. Jane heads the marketing for a customer engagement enablement platform. They're based out in New York. I had the opportunity to work with them in September last year. Now, what is this people who work in with data dashboard and devices? We are finding these people, also product people, by the way, we are finding them suffering from this particular thing that we call alienation of labor. What is alienation of labor? Alienation of labor is actually a very, very old concept which came out in the industrial revolution. So for example, try and understand this using a safety pins example. If you look at a tiny safety pin, a safety pin, there are 12 steps in the process of making a safety pin. Step one, step two, step three, step four, and like that, 12 steps. If I ask one person to do step one, step two, and all the steps, it'll be a while before I'll see some safety pins because it takes a long time. So me, the smart person said, I'm gonna get person A to do step one, person B to do step two, person B, C to do step three. There you go, in no time, I'll have a lot of safety pins. But the problem with that particular model is that even though it is an efficient model, person one doesn't know what person two is doing and person two doesn't know what person three is doing and they all together don't know what's the end product and they don't really care. That is the problem of alienation of labor where people are working on things but they are becoming really good at tools and losing the human connection. In this case, what we were learning was people who worked in the digital and mobile space, they were becoming excellent at managing the tools, but becoming really poor at understanding human beings for whom these tools were made. The issue that it created was that the tools that you were designing and the products you were making had very little empathy and very little ability to story. Listen, in 2013, a very famous transportation company that disrupted taxi services went to South America. I'm sure by now you have guessed what this company is. They went to South America 
and they had already established their business in rest of the world. So they went to South America and told the story of convenience, told the story of payment through your phone, told the story of if, you know not having to find car parks and all that sort of stuff. So it was a story of convenience that they kept telling in South America, but their service was not flourishing in that country. The reason for that was that South Americans were not looking for convenience. South Americans were looking for safety. Then they changed the story to safety. Every time you use a service, a new car, a new color, a new number plate, a new driver will arrive. As a result, the chances of you getting kidnapped are very, very little. If any one of you understand the context to this, you would know in South America that could be a problem. They shifted the story to be the story of safety and their service started to flourish. The problem with this was that the tool itself was fantastic. It was well built and it, the, the issue was that even though the tool was great, people had not story listened in that particular geography to be able to tell the right story. Let's bring it back a little bit to our home ground back to India. I don't think any one of us has an ability to say that we can innovate without having the ability to story listen and demonstrate empathy. One of the very loved leaders we have called Satya Nadella, who's the third CEO of Microsoft, wrote a book not that long ago, Hit Refresh. Has anyone read that book? Use the chat box and tell me, I'd love to know. Uh, in Hit Refresh, he has used the word empathy close to 70 times. And the reason why he's used the word empathy, because he's a true believer that you possibly cannot innovate unless you have empathy. Empathy is almost like story listening when you're actually really trying to wear someone else's shoes and understand what is the story you need to tell. Now, he mentions in this book, this wonderful example where he learned the importance of empathy. He says this was around the time when I was first being interviewed to work for Microsoft an up and coming manager at that time, Richard Tate interviewed me. And I walked into the interview that day and Richard asked me, um, Satya, I'm going to not ask you any algorithms and you know technical questions but I'm going to ask you a general question say you're driving on the road and then you see on the left hand side next to the dustbin there is a baby lying and crying what are you going to do Satya turned around and said well I'll call 911 at that time Richard didn't say anything to him but when the interview finished and Richard walked him out he put his arm around Satya and said you will first go pick up the baby and then you will call 911 that is the difference between having empathy, story, listening, and really understanding what the person needs or just assuming that you know what the person needs. Um, so in essence, I wanna say to all of you that if the goal is to forge a connection through communication, then storytelling is the right tool. Knowledge about people is not enough. You have to have an understanding of people. Giving people information is not enough. You have to communicate with people. And storytelling is never, never enough. Story listening is what is required. With this, I want to conclude my part of the speaking today. I'll let you uh, ask me questions that you might have. Back to you, Sandeep. Your insights into digital transformation and how it is impacting the lives of so many people was fascinating. And I'm sure the audience learned some lessons that we all can put into practice. So if I have to summarize one, you can't story tell unless you're willing to story listen. Digital transformation storytelling is about whys and hows. And storytelling again in digital transformation context comes with the promise to be a you know, workforce for the future. And those who learn to create empathy at scale will succeed in the digital economy. What an insightful session, Anjali. So I do have some questions for you. And uh, so uh, what stops corporate professionals from being a storyteller? And before you answer that, uh, what's your definition of corporate storytelling? 
Corporate storytelling is a very fine balance of somebody who has an ability to adopt an identity of a journalist and a marketer. The reason I say a journalist and a marketer is because a journalist goes and finds a story before he or she tells the story. A corporate professional has to have the ability to be able to go and find the story. Now, the difference is that a journalist is not looking and seeing, are people going to like the story? They just tell the truth. You like it or not, it's your problem. But in a corporate setting, you have to be slightly like a marketer. You have to find the story and you have to position the story in the right frame to get the desired outcome. What I mean by that is if you are getting a new CRM tool and you know that the CRM tool will allow you to gain market share, will avoid you working, your company working in silos, then that's not the story your people want to hear. Truly, I had one leader who said that in the town hall. And when I interviewed people in the organization, I said, you know, you're losing market share. That is why you need to get the new CRM system. The team member turned around and said, I don't get paid enough to worry about market share. So the point I'm making is that even though it is correct, it does not connect. The leader then was taught how to shape that story to show the individual how having the new CRM also is a promise for a better future for this person. Now, that is where you have to adopt a little bit of a marketer's identity as well. A corporate professional, corporate storyteller is a fine balance between a journalist and a marketer who finds the story and puts the time, effort, and all the resources required to shape the story to ensure that the listener goes, I feel the connection. Thank you for not just making it correct, and making sure that it also connects with me. So I see a dozen of questions coming from our audience, from LinkedIn, from YouTube, and from the Zoom window as well. Now, Kartikin wants to know, uh, what were the few challenges that you faced during digital transformation and how you address those challenges? Okay, so Katya, digital transformation, if you've asked this question, I'm making an assumption that you know this space well. Digital transformation is a big beast. Uh, so like a human body is a big beast, uh, then there is a heart doctor and there's a lung doctor and there's a kidney doctor. I'm a storytelling doctor, okay? I focus highly, I'm hyper hyper-focused on that particular area. So I will streamline your question slightly with your permission and say, I'll talk to you about the challenges we face when we build stories for digital transformation, okay? So when we build stories for digital transformation, our biggest challenge is this. Most people don't have the knowledge of what exactly is happening on the ground. They have broad knowledge, right? So they will say things like, uh, people are doing a lot of manual labor. People are not uh, working smart. Uh, people have duplication of effort. Then when I turn around and I say to them, kindly give, tell me about a time when someone you experienced duplicated the work, had a lot of manual labor where they shouldn't have had the manual labor. They're unable to give me actual stories. They fail to be journalists. They have broad stroke information and they tend to message it like most PR companies do. Um, so when we come in, when it comes to digital transformation storytelling, we have what we have found is that when we build stories, uh, we forget to be a journalist. We we don't really have the on the ground real stories. Everyone says, yeah, 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 I have, I have, I can tell, I can tell. But when you kind of start interrogating the process, those stories don't exist. Then that is a highlight to me that you're not really story listening. That's really interesting. So Vijay Netrajan has a very uh, interesting question. He says, isn't story listening same as active listening? If not, what's the difference? And here's a follow-up question that says, empathy is so much missing in instant grat gratification world in social media. What is one thing that we need to do to practice in daily life to practice empathy? Okay, so this, this, this is a big question. So what's the difference between story listening and active listening, right? That's the first part of the question, correct? And what's the second part of the question? Second one, he is asking you that uh, in today's world, that is, uh, you know, that relies most, mostly on instant gratification. Totally. Um, what is one thing that we need to practice in life, in daily life, to practice empathy? 
to practice empathy. Okay, the, so let me tell you that first the difference between active listening and story listening. Active listening can also be listening to someone's opinion. So I can say to you, you know, I don't think leadership here is really good. I don't think we make world-class products. You are actively listening to my opinions. Yeah, you're listening. I'm giving you opinion. Story listening is slightly different. It's when you, I say, you know, I don't really think we make good products here. Then you turn around and say, oh, talk to me about a time when you actually felt like we didn't make a good product. Tell me, tell me more about that product. Give me an example. Share with me. When you actually shift the person from giving you an opinion to actually narrating an experience where the thing has happened. We are very loyal to our experiences. We have broad stroked information and we just generally give information because we are biased to think in a certain way. But when I ask you, talk to me about a time when you felt when we don't make good products, then if I'm able to say two weeks ago when we were working on that, that is story listening. Active listening can be broad stroked opinion based. Story listening is a really detailing it down and getting to the nut, nitty gritties and getting the information out. The second part is you asked was, uh, what can we do? Yeah, we do live in a culture of fun, fast and easy. We are all victims of that. Um, and I must say we victimize ourselves towards that. Uh, what can we do to practice empathy? Can I tell you the twin sister of empathy is curiosity. Um, so what, what does that mean? What that means is, it's okay if you unknowingly did not understand something. You just have to be curious enough, right? So say, for example, I have curly hair, okay? Uh, and I'm slightly uncomfortable about having curly hair. But you come up to me and you are actually, rather than saying, ooh, your hair is so curly. Oh, that's curly hair. Oh, your hair so big. You're not having empathy, but you can be curious about it. Just say, oh, how did you get curly hair? You know, so it's curiosity is the twin sister of empathy. If you are curious about the world, you would 100% be empathetic. If someone's kind of suddenly flipping it, um, then you, if you, rather than reacting to it, be curious, why would this person be flipping it? Let me shift that to making a purchase on mobile. Okay, now there's a bo very bold lipstick color that I can use an app and purchase. I buy that lipstick color. The app company already knows this is a bold color and the lady who's buying this most likely after buying will regret buying it. Very, very bold color buying behavior. So the app company is curious about my behavior and actually sends me a message through the app and says, by the way, we think you look great in this bold color. Here are photos of some other ladies who have bought this color. But if you change your mind, do let us know and you can swap it with something else. That is called predictive story listening and demonstrating empathy at a scale. Be curious about individuals, why they do what they do, and then you can have empathy. Wow, I can't agree more. Now, uh, I have one more question from Aniket. He says, how do we initiate an environment of storytelling and uh, interactive in organization where employees don't prefer to listen and understand? So basically, how do we cultivate that culture of storytelling where people don't like to listen and understand? They are less empathetic probably. Okay, how do you start that? So, you know, uh, uh, sorry, who's, who's asked this question? That's Aniket. Aniket, you know, your question is almost like, um, it, it's, a, it's a question that is a very real question, okay? People don't want to listen. People just want to talk, okay? Uh, there are only three things that matter to people, which is I, me, and myself. If people could send themselves a email, they'll send a email, not an email. Uh, Self-relevance is super glue of attention. So everything is about them, 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 them. That's how human beings are. Uh, it's not like I'm saying people are bad. That's just how we are. Now, if people are not willing to listen, what can you do? I don't think you can give them that choice. You have to institutionalize listening, okay? You have to have a culture of the company where listening is a part of the culture. People listen before they speak. So you have to institutionalize listening. Now, let me give you an example of what institutionalizing listening looks like. Um, 
so for example, for example, there's a company, a large media company that has a hotline within the company. If you have a problem with the way the work, with the way the work is being done and nobody's listening to you, you can call on this number and express your concern. That is institutionalizing it. There is another company uh, that I read about just today that actually has a very funny culture. The funny culture is that when the morning meeting happens and all the executives sit, they have a gourd, like a bitter gourd or some vegetable. They pass around that gourd and only when you have the gourd in your hand, you're allowed to talk. Otherwise, you have to listen. Um, so these are tactics of institutionalizing listening. It's a little bit like my 14-year-old daughter. If she says, I don't want to study, that's not a choice, my darling. We are going to have to institutionalize in your studying. So the leader is going to have to look and not make this a choice. I don't want to listen. You are going to have to institutionalize in listening. Before people are saying, this is the story I want to tell, you have to ask, and what did you listen because of which you built this story? If you actually start institutionalizing listening, you will surely get to a place where story listening will not be a choice, but a part of your culture. Very true, very true. So Srinidhi is very empathetic and she is also very curious. So she wants to know, where do you get your energy from? Because you have been speaking close to 45 minutes without having even a sip of water. And how do you practice sessions like this? Sorry, who, whose question is that? Sri, Srinidhi. Srinidhi. Srinidhi, Srinidhi. No, you're right. Yeah. Thank you. That is such a lovely, you know, you just demonstrated empathy. Yeah. It's, it's almost 11.30 PM here. Uh, well done to you. You're not just saying you're empathetic. You're actually demonstrating empathy. Um, you know, when I did my first internship uh, as a waitress in, in, uh, in New Delhi, in, uh, in um, Limeridian Hotel near Connaught Place, uh, as a waitress, uh, the, the guy who was heading the restaurant he called me and said to me, I have a very important question for you. Um, I was, I was what not, just, just about 19, 18, 18, 17, something like that. And I said, what's the question? He says, Apni mammi ko pucho, and I'll translate it into English for those of you who don't understand. Sa tonic tha jab aapko paida karne wale the? Aap mein itni energy kahan se aai? So those of you who don't understand English, um, Hindi, uh, what I said that this person, the supervisor asked me, go ask your mom, what tonic did she drink when she was pregnant with me? Um, and that actually, um, you know, gives me all the energy. But that jokes aside, the truth is, uh, for me, it may be 1130. But for 70 odd people who've decided to listen to me, this is the first time they're listening to me. Uh, I have to be empathetic towards them and make sure that I make it worth their time. So energy for me is Did we lose Anjali? Is she stuck? Yes, I thought my video got stuck. But no, uh, yeah. So sorry for the inconvenience audience. Anjali will join us right back. Please stay tuned. Folks, Anjali will be joining us right back. Please hold on and we'll answer the rest of the questions. Hi, Anjali. I'm so sorry. I think I lost, lost you guys for a bit for there. Minute. No worries. We can carry on. Audience is still. Oh, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. Okay. So I think I was answering the question on the energy. I literally psych myself up. And I think the second part of your question, and I, I highly recommend you psych yourself up as well. It really works. Uh, the second part of your question was uh, that 
how do I get better at storytelling? Was that the question? Yeah, how do you practice? How, how do, do I practice? How do you practice without <laughs> even having a sip of water? Okay, without how do I practice? I think it's the passion that actually makes you forget that you even need water. So, you know, it's like you're like, oh, I don't care about water right now. I just want to give it all I have. Great. Importantly, the question is, how do I practice? How do I practice is, again, I institutionalize my practice. I don't say, I'm going to be good and I'm going to practice. Practice is never going to happen. Okay, so those two videos that I do, uh, every Saturday, I put out a story on LinkedIn. Um, tomorrow, there's a story on psychological safety about a NASA engineer. Um, I have to find that story. I have to be able to tell that story in one take. All our stories are one take. So it's the repeated practice of my craft uh, the institutionalizing, the commitment to the world that every Saturday I will show up with a story and every Wednesday I'll share a storytelling insight with you is institutionalizing my practice. And when you do that repeatedly, you see you become good at it, you get progress and progress is a massive motivator. When you see progress, people comment, people like, people follow, you feel like you want to do more and more. So though that would be my answer. Great. So I'll take one last question from the audience. Uh, Puneet asks, interviews normally circle around more of storytelling. So how can one turn it into an opportunity for story listening? Mm. Okay. So now Puneet's question is a great question. Um, I think what he's uh, saying is how can you turn it into a story listening? Uh, op, uh, so if you are being in, so if you are interviewing someone, it's super easy, right? Uh, you can ask them to tell you a story and uh, you can story listen. But I think his question is more about you are constantly as in somebody who's being interviewed, you're constantly asked about, talk to me about a time where you demonstrated innovation. So then it becomes a storytelling opportunity. How would you turn it into a story listening opportunity? Um, I don't think you can escape storytelling in an interview because you are being interviewed. But what you can do is that section when they say, do you have any questions for us? Um, you know, and if they don't, you should say, can I ask some questions, please? Um, so in that case, you have to get really good at asking not the why questions. Why questions are not good story uh, story elic eliciting, eliciting questions. Don't ask why questions. Ask questions based on when, where, uh, when and where questions are very good story eliciting questions. So you could say, uh, when was it that you felt like you needed to fulfill a role of chief creative officer that you are fulfilling with, with you know, interviewing me today? Or, uh, where was it that the decision to have a new department uh, for which I'm being interviewed today was made? That when and where questions are super at a story eliciting. So I think uh, in an interview, you can't escape storytelling because you are being interviewed. But if you wanna inject story listening, what you can do is to maximize the opportunity when you get asked, do you have any questions? And if you don't get asked, do you have any questions? Be courageous to turn around and say, I actually would like to ask a couple of questions as well. And if you ask when and where questions, most likely you'll get a story. Nice. Anjali, on behalf of everyone here today, I would like to thank you for taking time to speak to us. We are eager to get a copy of your book and do let us know from where we can uh, you know, grab a copy, uh, copy of your book. And before you wrap up, please let the audience know in case if they want to learn more from you, how can they do that? Just, just come and connect with me on LinkedIn. You know, I mean, there's two times I actually share, uh, you know, a Wednesday in, uh, in the story insight and Saturday story. I also publish a blog every week. Uh, the blog's been going since 2014. Um, I only do one thing, which is storytelling. So you will never see convoluted messages from me, like, you know, about this also and about that also. I only talk about storytelling. So I write every, every week or once a week. I publish two videos, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn and, and uh, or DM me on LinkedIn if you wanna know more and we can, we can take it from there. Absolutely. Shama, would you like to add anything here? Yes. Uh, firstly, thank you, Anjali, for the brilliant and engaging session. 
really captivating keynote with some amazingly relevant and useful insights. I'm sure the audience also feels the same. So audience, please go ahead and post your feedback in the chat window so we know how you feel. Now for the most exciting part of the session, the last part, um, Sandeer, I request you to announce the winner for the best asked question so we can reward them with the scholarship. Absolutely. So I think it's Kartikeyan and I like the question about, you know, the challenges that people face during digital transformation. It was really good to hear from Anjali. So Kartikeyan is a winner today. Congratulations, Kartikeyan. And Anjali, do you want to pick a question too, which you really liked? Um, I, I loved that question as well. I think it was a very, very smart question. Uh, but let me let me quickly just remind my memory. What are the other questions asked? Um, okay, this might be just because I've forgotten all the other questions, so That's I might right. be just going for the one that is in my in my recent memory. Um, I think who asked that question about living in a culture of uh, fun, fast, and easy instant gratification? How do you uh, how do you actually build? Uh, the ability to have empathy. That question was a good question as well. That is Vijay, Vijay Nakajan. Yeah, that was a really good question. Um, I think the acknowledgement that we live in a fun, fast and easy culture filled with uh, instant gratification is a, is a massive, massive roadblock for story listening. So I think there was a good relation between what I was saying and in that question. Perfect. So because it's the finale today, we are going to give out two scholarships. Congratulations, Vijay, on winning the scholarship too. We have enjoyed having you with us, Anjali. It's been a complete pleasure. Please accept this certificate of appreciation from the Institute, a small gesture. We are grateful for Thank the time you. and effort you took to share your thoughts and amazing insights drawn from years of experience in the industry. Pleasure so is all mine. The, Thank you. Right. So if you scan the QR code on the uh, certificate, Anjali, it'll take you to a dedicated Hall of Fame page that we've created for you, uh, which will hold the recording of the session. Just give it a few uh, hours. It'll get uploaded. And uh, I'm sure the audience has learned a lot from your session. Thank you once again for joining us. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you very much. I, I see some of the questions I couldn't respond. They were in the chat box. Um, I'm very happy for you to connect with me. And if you genuinely really wanted to know the answers, I will always be happy to respond to them. I wish you all the best. Stay storied and stay connected. Stay safe. <laughs>